Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Inside the OC, the podcast dedicated entirely to the USBC Open Championships. My name is Matt Canizaro. Glad to be here today. And now we'd like to bring in my co-host for today's show from Kentucky, Daniel Farish. Hey, Matt. Daniel glad Farish. to be here. Uh, rainy and cold here in Louisville, but we're inside, so the weather doesn't affect the broadcast, thankfully. Hey, perfect day for being online and <laughs> uh, telling the world about the Open Championships. And uh, we've got a great guest here on today's show. Uh, it's been a minute since we've seen him in the spotlight at the USBC Open Championships, but he has a bit of a legacy on the tournament lanes and in the Midwest. And uh, we'll talk about some of his great stories, both from the Open Championships and from the official uh, PBA message boards, Midwest Dictionary, uh, and some great fry stories as well. Welcoming in from Illinois, Michael Nape. How are you today, sir? Good. How are you guys doing? Doing well. Good. We're Excited doing to great. do it. It's going to be fun. All right. Well, we, uh, we're looking forward to, to hearing some of your stories. We know uh, your legacy goes back uh, about two decades, if not more, uh, in the Midwest region and, and at the Open Championships back to 1988. Uh, so we'll turn back the, the hands of time a little bit. Uh, just a, a little basic introduction. Uh, and uh, just so the folks know, outside of the Midwest who we're talking to, um, again, your Open Championships career started back in the late 80s. And uh, you've been a, a longtime manager at, uh, at Fox Bowl in Illinois, a famous name at the Open Championships, uh, very dedicated to bringing teams each year. And one of those great teams uh, has been yours. And uh, that team put together an amazing year in 2008, picked up a team all events title. We'll talk about that and what that meant after many close calls. I'll talk about some of your big scores and biggest fries, as they say, uh, both at the Open Championships and elsewhere. Um, with that said, uh, certainly, uh, just the basics, uh, but tell us a little bit more kind of about, uh, about you and what you've been up to, uh, especially these last couple of weeks and uh, especially being in the bowling business. Well, obviously everyone's, uh, trying to figure out how to deal with, uh, this COVID-19 pandemic going on and it's affecting a lot of businesses. So, uh, I've been laid off, um, Fox Bowl I've worked at for. 25 years and uh it's been great i mean i couldn't ask for a better place to work great owners tom sims kim sims new owners steve bernard barbara bernard and of course all my longtime co-workers jim thatcher tony pizzullo all those guys i mean we're a big family over there so we're all staying together um you know i'm not working right now which is fine um we need to do what we can to get fox bolt open and you know, we're going to follow the rules as we need to in order to get ourselves ready to open. Our league bowlers have been um, very patient, um, making sure that we do what we need to do. Uh, Stella's Pizza has been open, so our pizza sales have been good. But we're going to get back. Fox Bowl has a legacy. Fox Bowl is a busy bowling center, and we're going to be back. Right, we appreciate uh, all the hard work there, and uh, you had me at pizza. To be honest yeah. with you, uh, I need it's to... good too. Don't be, don't. Uh, it's like good Chicago thin crust pizza, not deep dish. But I mean, it's legit. It's really good. Well, that's, that's the magic word. Once you guys are back open, I'm uh, I'm gonna make my way to Chicago area and visit Emil Williams Jr. and his family and uh, bring in some pizza. That sounds like a like a good if time. If you're in town, I got you. Much appreciated. All right, well, let's uh, let's get to the good stuff. And uh, you know, you mentioned not being in work right now, but uh, some time I think to spend uh, quality time with the family. You got the two kids home from college right now, right? Uh, little, oh yeah, yeah. Little time Michael with them. Jr. Mm -hmm. He's uh, he's home, and uh, Allison is a senior this year, so she's pretty upset about missing her uh, senior year in high school and missing out on prom and graduation and all that stuff. But, you know, so is a lot of other people. She's dealing with it. Um, but it has been nice having the kids around. We've been cleaning the house, <laughs> which they don't like. <laughs> but, but they love that, don't shape. they? <laughs> uh, there it is. And, time, time well spent there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Junior likes to eat, so he's always cooking. So he cooks what he likes, and then he makes family dinners. It's, it's it, You know, it could be worse, that's for sure. Everybody's getting along and doing their thing. Definitely glad to hear there's an upside, of course, to, uh, to yeah. all the all the things going on. 
I'm hoping they peek their head in, give them a little camera time. Okay, well, we're going to give them some story time here as, uh, oh, yeah. as we get going here. Um, and all, as always, uh, I'm going to take it back to, uh, to our first interaction uh, for you and I. It was at the 2006 Open Championships, and you've already had a, a pretty stellar career to that point, which we'll talk about some of the details along the way here. But uh, in 2006, you were making a run at uh, what would have been your first Eagle at the OC. A big moment for you uh, coming down to the final frames. Uh, you had a chance at the all events lead, and uh, it looked like it was going to be a done deal uh, on paper. Uh, pretty much uh, anything could have gone wrong, and it still would have been okay. But uh, it was uh, actually turned out to be uh, the worst possible case scenario. Back to back open frames to finish game number nine uh, and fell a little bit short. Uh, you knew it. I knew it. Uh, I didn't know what to do at that point. And uh, I would say, um, seeing you you're coming off the approach, uh, there was uh, there was some fear in my eyes. I think the other people could see it, um, being that uh, you know your your reputation, you're an emotional bowler, um, and uh, I knew there was going to potentially be some fire at that point, uh, and rightfully so. Uh, but uh, if I wasn't looking at that moment, uh, I wouldn't have seen uh, the the Lynn's shoe uh, whiz by my head. I believe it was uh, in that moment of frustration. Uh, I was able to kind of matrix my way out of it, um, and. Uh, <laughs> and, and that was, uh, as expected, of course, a, a very challenging moment for you. Uh, and then minutes later, you know, I, I, I had to do what I had to do, which is always tough uh, in those, uh, those defeats, having to, to still write the story and tell the news. Uh, and you calmly uh, came over and said you just needed a couple minutes to, uh, to, to regroup a little bit and, and, and uh, get your mind straight. And, uh, and then you came back and uh, absolutely the, the nicest guy that, uh, that I could have asked for to come over and, and tell me about that day and that moment. But uh, now, so many years later, uh, tell me about things from your side, your perspective uh, in that moment. Well, obviously, I was having a good tournament. Um, I was playing, you know, by by the end of the tournament, you know, you're in at six arrow, you know, and this is kind of before everyone started lofting the gutter. You play fallback, so I was bowling with uh, Zika, uh, Nathan Michalowski, Greg Bollinger, and myself. <clears throat> Greg and Nathan um, knew I had a shot at it. They uh, they stayed right. Um, you know, they wanted to keep the track open and try not to shimwreck me. Uh, you know, in a six arrow, there ain't a lot of hold in there. You got to create your hold. Um, and I was bowling good. I was throwing the ball good. Up comes the ninth frame. Ball just hooked. I did not make a bad shot. I remember the ball. I was throwing a Triton Elite pin in the palm. And the ball just hooked. And I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, what am I going to do? You know, the lanes broke down. I'm moving, and you're moving basically one board every shot, and I big four. Fry, of course, I'm pissed, you know. Whatever. I go, okay, well, coming up in the 10th, I don't want to go high again. So I make like a four and two. Now I got to loft it a little bit over the gutter, and I two five. Nobody wants to shoot the 2-5 ever. That spare sucks. So, of course, what do I do? I chop and super fry. I was I was mad. You know, here you got this tournament right in front of you. Um, I don't remember the math, but obviously I've been had, having a pretty good career. I don't remember if I was the average leader then or not. But I knew I, I had a good career. And you only get so many opportunities. And it's not like I did anything wrong. I, I would admit I'd cop to it if I threw it like crap and I elbowed it or I yanked. The ball just hooked. Playing 6 0 fallback. Ball just hooked. What are you going to do? I can still feel it. Um, so I get my two and then I chop the two five super fry. And uh, I guess I did wheel that 13 wide lens and it sort of went <laughs> towards your head, but it wasn't on purpose. No, uh, absolutely not. I, I know. And, of course. And for me, I got to get out of there because I'm gonna, I'm gonna go nuts. You know, I'm gonna power rage. So, you know, I think I said something in passing. I'm like, oh, I just need some time. Mm -hmm. So I just left. I don't even think I had any shoes on. I found a second floor somewhere up at the in the convention center, and I sat out there and I just looked until I calmed down. And uh, I don't know. I I bet I was gone a good solid 10, 15 minutes, and uh, I got myself together. And then we had a nice interview. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it stinks the way that it, it, it comes about with bowling. 
you know, there's a good phrase for that. Um, but bowling is what it is. The lanes change. You don't know. You make preemptive moves. You make your shots. And sometimes it just doesn't work out that way. And that's just the way that it was. Now, to that point, the, the entirety of your career had been with pretty talented groups from the Chicago area. Oh, yeah. uh, so you understood the prestige of the event. Uh, you had the 300 game back in 96 in Salt Lake City. Uh, and then you had a runner-up team finish in 2004. So you had been close, uh, and you knew how much it meant. Uh, to let yeah. that one slip away, looking back, um, you know, you finished with 21.56 just inside the top 10. The number was 21.89. So uh, definitely a close call. You know, it's uh, still pissing me off, so don't remind me too much. <laughs> well, and, th and that just goes to show just how much it means and, and, oh, yeah. and the passion and the fire and just, uh, you know, just – like as you said, you don't have many chances, uh, and uh, and you were you were very very close in that moment. Yeah, you know, I mean, if I had to do it over again, I guess I would have moved another two and one, try to catch a little more bush. But what are you gonna do? That's over now. It still hurts, but I'm glad I got one eagle. Well, and two years later, uh, again, you guys you guys got it done, and that's that's the important thing. Um, you know, you were uh, flirting with the the top of the the lifetime average list. Uh, you were on top at, at one point, um, and then you came in in 2008. And um, I think uh, it started with a little bit more heartbreak, though, as well. You guys made a run at the team event, uh, came up short, and then that's really where you had the opportunity to shine as the leader, as the veteran of the group, to, to make everybody realize that just because the team event didn't happen, there was still a whole other day of bowling, six more games, and, uh, and, a, and a big opportunity for the team all event. And here's what you got to understand about bowling that most people don't get. Now, if you take a look at when we won the Eagle, I was low. All them years I lead, you know, and it's all about lane play, how you match up. You know, all the guys around me bowled great, and they carried me to that Eagle. I mean, if I would have known I had to be low in order to win an Eagle, I might have done that a few years ago. Of course, I say that as a joke. But they all matched up, which means I didn't really match up as good. I remember team event, I had to leave at least 10 10 pins. I could not get the 10 out. I remember the bowling balls I had. I just couldn't get the 10 out. You know, I do remember that I doubled in the 10th for us, I think, to get in the third. And uh, I didn't bowl as good as I could have. And uh, I was getting to the pocket, but for whatever reason, my ball roll would not strike that year because of my bowling balls. So I think that's when they had the little two-game tournament. I went and I bowled a couple sets, made sure I was throwing the ball real good. And uh, I came back the next day. And, uh, you know, I think I had a couple of 680s, which is respectable. So, you know, when those guys are matching up, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to match up. And that's what it is. That's why it's so hard to win an eagle, an all events eagle, especially because everyone's got to match up. You got to bowl good. You can't have one dog in there or you're going to take everybody down. After not, you know, bowling as good as I could have, those guys carried me. And then I came back and, you know, I had pretty good score the next day and we got there. But it was pretty amazing. There's a pretty good story with that, too. Obviously, uh, you know, we knew we were close and we were bowling opposite squads. Uh, Greg, myself, and Walt. Hi, Walt. Um, we were on a squad, we were bowling uh, our set together, and then uh, Tony Jordan and Pete were on a different squad. Uh, that way we could break up brackets. And uh, Tom Sims, thanks, Tom. Good job adding. Um, you remember this, Matt. <laughs> Tom basically said that we couldn't win. And we're like, oh, you know, and it's a letdown or whatever. We're like, oh, well, we did everything we could. We're going to miss by 100 pins. Tom says that, oh, no, you guys can't get there. And then Matt comes over. And he's like, they only need to shoot like 403 and you can win an eagle. And me and Greg, we were like, we were like, oh, my God, we could win. And then I, I mean, I had no control over it at this point because I'm not the one bowling. So I got to watch these guys bowl and put my faith in that they're going to do it. And uh, to their credit, Tony and Pete, they were calm, man. They, did, they weren't shook. But I couldn't watch. I remember I just had to leave. <laughs> I had to go walk around. I'm walking around the concourse waiting and waiting. And then uh, I think Greg came. Their score was was there. And I think they were, they had about 430 going into like the 10th frame or something. And then we had to leave. And I just remember uh, 
I think Greg jumped into my arms because he likes to do that sort of thing, you know. How Greg is. <laughs> um, and you know, we had a little tear in our eye, and Tom Sims was there, and of course, Tom added wrong. What what doesn't Tom? Thanks, Tom. Again, um, but we that was pretty cool. You know, we were thinking that we were out of it, and can you imagine that emotion? You think you're out of it, you're not going to be able to win an eagle, and then lo and behold, Tom can't add, and Matt says no. All they need is 4-0, and you guys can get there, and we got there. Both. Well, I'm glad I could be there at the opposite end of the uh, of the emotional spectrum there after 2006. Things uh, totally different in 2008, so glad I was able to bring a little good news to the party. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool, man. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you weren't scared of me, Matt. I only look mean. <laughs> that's true. Only now mean now you, I know. I'm only mean if you piss me off. <laughs> uh, also, file that one in the back, Ferris. <laughs> Yeah, I'll I will uh I'll remember that for any future occurrences. Um, a couple questions I got for you, Mike, on just on a couple yeah. of the the stories you told. Um, you touched on this a little bit, and I feel like it's it's a very routine question to ask, but yeah. you experienced the low of lows in '06 and the high of highs just a couple of years later, and you almost experienced that low again when the math was done wrong and you thought you couldn't get there. But kind of just talk about what it was like going from 06 to missing it, you know, the, the, the way you finished and missing out on on that potential eagle to finally capturing it in, in 08 after just about, you know, over 20 years of, of bowling at the tournament. Well, I mean, I, I had set a few goals in my career. And, uh, you know, people talk, oh, you set a goal, you can accomplish things. It's really good advice, actually. And one of my goals was to win an eagle. Um, I wanted to win PBA events, you know, the regionals I, I did. I bowled in the tournament champions. Um, but Eagle, you know, I'm just a dirty kid from the South side. I grew up in Blue Island, you know, my radius wasn't that big. It was the South side of Chicago Bowl and at Anchor Bowl, Earl Bowl, which is still there, Riverdale, um, Tri-City Lanes, Evergreen Towers, Bleakers, you know, all these places where I bowled, that's where I bowled. You knew the guys who you bowled around and I was lucky enough to get hooked up uh, with uh, some of the great bowlers like uh, Denny Campbell. Bill Slatteritz, um, Dave Kappel, Mark DeFlippis, these guys, Mike Steinbeck, that's one guy there, man. That guy, he really kind of helped me understand how to play fallback when I was young. You know, my parents didn't bowl, so I was kind of trying to figure things out on my own, and I just liked the ball. So I stayed around where I was, um, and one of the big goals was these guys all talked about bowling nationals. You got to bowl the ABCs because that's what it was. Then. Uh -huh. And you got to get ready for the ABCs. And I mean, I listened to the elder statesman. I worked at it. I learned how to play inside. You knew that you weren't going to be able to shoot big scores. The lanes were tough and you better make shots and you better make your spares. And I listened to them. So that being said, you know, I had a few good years and I bowled with those guys. I didn't go around trying to make a super team or anything. It's not like I was LeBron. I was bowling with the guys that I bowled with. Um, so we had some decent teams, but we didn't have any, any powerful teams. We just had some good events uh -huh. and you try to put yourself in a position to win. So obviously the low was, you know, getting close to winning an indiv individual one, which was crushing. I mean, when you're competitive and you really want something, you know, it hurts when you don't achieve it. Then we come to the high, you know, and once you realize that you're in the lead, it's like, I don't know, it's light and airy. And it, I mean, it's elation. It feels wonderful. And then I remember, man, I was driving home from fishing. I, I think it was you called so that we, our score did hold up and we won. And man, it just makes you smile. It's almost like, like a relief when you win because it's like you're all built up you do all these things you don't have championships it's like come on man you gotta get there and we got there it was amazing well now you guys bowled in late june so the wait was relatively short for you um, well, yeah i and, hate to lead like in the first uh, week <laughs> uh, but can you describe that uh, it was basically two weeks that you had to wait and then as you said you're you're out relaxing fishing a little bit i don't think it was uh you're very calm out there knowing the event was ending uh, and that phone call was coming but can you describe the wait, uh, and then to finally hear the words that uh, that you were a champion at the OC and, uh, you know, that burden and, and all that excitement just kind of intermingling at that point? Or you try to keep yourself busy so you don't think about it. You know, everyone's like, oh, you guys are leading. Do you think you're going to win? You know, what are you supposed to say? 
yeah, we're going to win, or no, I don't know. I just hope no one beats us. What do you say? You know, you say all the normal stuff. You just try to stay busy. You try to you think, hey, if it's my time, we're going to win. And, uh, you know, finally when we held on for the win, it was like, you know, it's relief, relief that you finally got an eagle. You know, and who doesn't want to win an eagle? You know, you got plenty of guys who have more than one. But to have an eagle is is something. It's prestige. It, it puts you a step above. You know, it ain't easy to win. You know, and especially at Team All Events, that's a rough one. You look at some of the teams that have won the Team All Events, they're all good bowlers. You know, you might have a guy that gets on a pair and, you know, God bless them for whacking them in singles. You know, you match up and you take full advantage. But you got to put five guys together for nine games apiece, man. That's doing something. And, you know, I love all them guys. Pete, Tony, Greg, and Walt. It was awesome. We had a little party at my house that year. I had the Eagle party. It was a good time. All right. Now, the uh, the taking the lead, of course, is just one part of it. And there's a, there's a look at the team there. Um you know, taking the lead is one part. The weight, the phone call is another. Uh, at what point did it really sink in for you? With the there's, I'm sure a, a nice big ego celebration and, and a presentation for you. Uh, then you got to come back the next year as the defending champs. Uh, but uh, when did it really click and sink in that that you had finally done it? I think the next year when we were getting on the lanes to bowl. <laughs> you know, it's like you, you're you're kind of when when you're bowling good and you're, you're expecting to win everything you. You just kind of think it goes with the territory and you don't kind of get to enjoy it sometimes because there's always like, oh, you guys are good. You guys got to bowl good all the time. But the next year when we came on the, onto the lanes as champions, it's like all these people come to this tournament year after year trying to win. And here we won. I, I couldn't bowl for like two frames. I like <laughs> yanked every shot. I went through the nose like five straight frames until I got my shit together, you know. Right, See, that, that's kind of what, what I wanted to ask about was, were there any additional nerves when you oh, hit the lanes yeah, that next yeah. year? And how long did it take to get over them? Yeah, I mean, right there. I mean, five shots. I think I opened the first three frames. It's just like, <laughs> you're like, oh, we won. Now I'm just yanking everything. And with, usually I'm good under pressure, but I don't know. The gravity of it, I guess. And then the expectations. Oh, you guys are a good team. You got to bowl good every year. And it goes with the territory. But I'd say the next year, that's when you finally realize, oh, man, we got an eagle. Well, that was kind of my, my follow-up is you had the pressure of coming back as defending champions, but um, or the, the nerves of it, was there any pressure to maybe uh, defend the title or at least put up a decent number? Because like you said, teams and people knew that you guys were the, the defending champions and the team to beat. Yeah, for sure. But, you know, once you get over it, then we're bowling. I think we bowled really good that year too. I think we shot over 10,000 again. You know, I don't remember exactly where we placed, but we shot a big set. We, I think we shot higher than we did when we won. The lanes were a lot easier that year, but, I mean, I don't remember. If we were second or third the next year in, all, in uh, Team Albans. And, you know, we had another good set. Uh, mm -hmm. You went on, personally, you had a, you had a, quite a run uh, after the win, um, especially going back to Reno, 10-11, 13, and 14. You had four of your best years. Uh, we had you on the live stream at one point. Uh, you guys made another run uh, in the team event as well. Um, so some excitement, some again, some some momentum, I guess, uh, at, at that point and uh, being introduced as champions every year and, and the whole experience. And um, if you can describe those, those few years to follow, again, some close calls, but, uh, but didn't get back there. Uh, and then things have quieted down for you a little bit in the years since. Uh, just talk about kind of where things have come since 2008. Well, 08, I, I just dead smashed everything I bowled. I think I dropped my PBA card in 07, and I just crushed everything after that. We got the Eagle in Chicago Landers, a tournament called uh, the Sometimes Beat the Champs. I won a car. Boat. I mean, everyone at home knows what boat means. Um, but, man, I won a car, dude, for real. I still drive that thing. I got 255,000 miles on it. Um, I won... Uh, there's a Grand Boot Hill tournament in Vegas. I won a sweeper there and drilled some tournaments around. I was just on fire, bowling good, you know. You know, you get a little confidence and, and you loosen up a little bit. And I don't know. I was just bowling good. And then nationals, that's – I don't remember the years. I'm not good at that stuff. But I was right around having the average lead, and I really wanted to keep it. 
I think I got on top, had it for two years, then I lost it, and then I took it back for two years, and then injuries set in and all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, once your elbow, my elbow's been bad since I blew it out my final game pitching in high school, and then went on tour and popped a bone spur loose in 1995 in Fountain Valley, California. Um, so it was just a matter of time before it finally gave. Um, but man, my head, yeah, I did have a good run. I was crushing and I ran it as long as I could until injury set in and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. Now this is something of course that now you can share with your, with your family. Your son is at 19 years old. Uh, he's itching to get out there with you. Uh, you said he doesn't know a whole lot of these stories and about, uh, some of the antics on and off the lanes and, and he sees the trophies. Uh, but maybe doesn't uh, doesn't yet understand uh, the prestige. And there's a look at you guys from the 2011 event here at the National Bowling Stadium. Uh, a phenomenal year for you. Shot 21-23 that year uh, in all events and still had it, uh, of course. As you said, uh, things starting to wind down. Uh, but uh, a great shot there. And uh, there's, there's all the teammates. And uh, I'm sure very special every time you guys take the lanes. But uh, now the opportunity to potentially do that with your son. Uh, so perhaps a reason to kind of get back in bowling shape and fix up the things that aren't feeling so good and uh, maybe take him out there and teach him all about the Open Championships? Yeah, there he is in the picture now. That's Junior. Hello. There he is. What's up, sir? How are you? Doing good. How are you? Yeah, all I right. want to go doubles with him, you know. I mean, I with the injuries and everything and – I'm I'm happy to go out there and bowl. I don't think I'm going to be shooting 2100s anymore. I just don't open up the lane like I used to. I mean, I can still throw the ball good enough. Uh, barring any injuries, I can still shoot, you know, pretty solid sets. Um, but now, I, yeah, of course, I'd like to bowl with them. Catch a what team event, pull yeah. some uh, doubles. Yeah. What would it mean to to explain just a little bit about the the eagle next to your name on the scoreboard and being introduced and um, you know, sharing that first march to the lanes, that's that's pretty special any year. But to be able yeah. to do that with your son, um, I can't imagine uh, anything better. Yeah, I just hope he's proud of his dad. Um, you know, that's all. Make him proud. Understand that it isn't about when you win or, you know, the championships are good, but go out there and try to represent yourself well. I know sometimes I didn't always do that, but sometimes I'd get a little pissed and throw shoes at reporters, right. but, you know. <laughs> You just try to be good, and that's why afterwards I'm a good guy. You just get caught up in it. But, you know, you just want to go out there and do your best, and if you can catch a win, man, you enjoy it because it ain't easy. All right, well, we're going to talk about some of those moments and some of those fries, and here's uh, here's a look at uh, the article. Uh, courtesy of Emil Williams, Jr. Mike Nate yeah. wins the car. That is, uh, that is a sweet-looking prize there. Almost as good as an eagle, but uh, maybe, maybe not quite. No, not quite as a prestige, but, man, that thing's been valuable. <laughs> I drive uh, 70 miles back and forth to Fox every day, six, seven days a week. Dude, that thing has saved me so much money and gas. That but like, awesome. if, you, if you look at this, I was sick when I won this thing, man. I've been like fighting adversity all the time. I remember this. I had strep throat. And then for whatever reason, the, the medicine that I was taking caused me to have a flare up of gout in my foot. My foot freaking hurt, dude. But. You know, all that makes the stories better. That's uh, dude, that's all for real. And, and you know what it was? And I know it sounds silly, and 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 people think they want to hear all these great things. And dude, it was just about perseverance. I was hurting. My foot hurt. You block it out. You take some Advil. You might take a Vicodin, and you power through it. But the whole time I was trying to win that car, and for whatever reason, I knew I was winning that car. I knew I was winning that car when I bowled it because. I'm driving all the miles in my Chevy Tahoe, spending ridiculous amount of money and gas. I decided I was going to win this car. Qualified, I had a big set. I shot 770 something at the qualifying round, and then went into the finals. And uh, Tony Bazzullo bowled in league at that house that morning, and he told everyone Mike's winning the car. And yeah. I won the car. I, I just knew it. I just knew I wasn't going to get beat. I don't know. I've had that feeling a few times, and. My whole thing was persevere. You got pain in your foot, so what? You can beat this. I mean, my dad fought cancer for 14 years. He didn't give up anything. And here I'm just doing bowling. And I'm like, you know what? So my foot hurts. Dad fought for all these years. 
I'm going to do it. I can get through this. Now, I I, I'm sure I'm sure you've instilled some of that determination in uh, in your kids. And um, what kind of advice do you have for your son as he embarks on his bowling career and and as he heads out to the Open Championships? Just things that you've learned, you know, from your guys over the years, and um, to to go in and and understand the the prestige and, and respect the event. And, um, but what can you tell him about uh, about going in there and and trying to become the dominant player that you were? Make your spares. Don't give up spares. That's, I mean, I've been 30 clean a bunch of times. You know, I, obviously I had a pretty good strike ball, but I didn't miss spares. And I think that's one of the reasons I always had a good career. You can't give away pins ever. And especially when you got tough lane conditions, you give them up, man. That's just free pins. Make your spares, execute good shots, read the lanes. And, you know, if your teammates can help you out, you listen to them and you communicate. Well, Daniel was bragging earlier about some of his uh, 30 clean awards as well because he knows <laughs> as uh, as much as I tried over the years, the best I ever got was uh, was 29 clean. So uh, no no trophies behind me today. Matt, Matt, I, got, I do have two of my 30 clean well, clocks behind me just just for you. Just I for appreciate you. that. Thank I you. got a 30 clean story if you want to hear it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I don't remember what year it was, but, you know, I'm still bowling pretty good. I think I shot 2,000 or 2,100 that year, and uh, I'm throwing the ball good. And I'm bowling good. And I know where I'm at. I know I'm clean. And, you know, you got, everyone knows what brackets are. I'm alive in a bunch of brackets. I'm sure of it. I don't remember exactly what. I think I ended up shooting 227. Come into the 10th frame. I can punch. I can get up over, you know, shoot a big set, have another 21, 2,000 plus. I don't remember what the score was, but it was a good score. Come up into the 10th frame, and I nut it. You know, you throw the ball as a bowler. You know if you throw it good. Yeah. My pocket seven ten, fry, <laughs> dude, like power rage. <laughs> I'm gonna be thirty clean again. I'm alive in a ton of brackets, and I pocket seven ten. So I didn't throw my shoes, but I kind of kicked them off, and they went flying. And this is at the stadium, so I just okay. kicked them off, and I storm out, and uh, I go into the bathroom, and of course I'm muttering as I'm walking, trying to get away so people can't see me fry. So I go into the bathroom and I walk into the bathroom at the stadium, you know, the one like kind of by the concession stand. Mm -hmm. And I didn't punch, I smacked the towel dispenser, but of course it made a loud noise. Of course. And obviously I, <laughs> obviously I scared someone. So they told security, <laughs> so they tell security, oh my God, there's a guy in the bathroom going nuts, you know? So this. <laughs> This is the security guy. And by then I'm taking a whiz, you know, and uh, <laughs> the guy comes in. Are you like hitting stuff in here? I go, no. I said, but I am pissed. I go, 10 in a 10th. I could have been 30 clean. I'm alive in brackets. Probably cost me a G. Yeah, I'm freaking pissed. And he's like, oh, you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm good now. He's like, oh, okay, <laughs> bye. <laughs> I that's the first All time right. I had security come. And he goes, I was crying. <laughs> See the only uh, the, the only fry out of nationals that I can remember that I ever had was 2012 in Baton Rouge, and I bowled so bad in team event, kind of like like you did in 08. I went somewhere after team event to practice, and so I come back for singles and doubles the next day, and man, I'm just I'm still not throwing the ball well. I, I shoot a, a small six or a, a mid to high five in in uh, doubles, and singles I'm leaving every single pin I can possibly leave on the pin deck, but I'm clean through 29 frames. And I get up in the 10th. We're one of the last teams done. I'm tired. I want to get out of there. I throw what I thought was a good shot and go fast eight, leave before seven. Ball gets stuck in the back. It takes about 10 minutes for them to find it, reset the spare, oh, and, and, and get all that finished. I'm thinking to myself, just make the spare, make the spare, clean 30. It's extra jackpot. It's bracket money. Just get out of here. And I go up and just ditch my spare ball in the gutter at about 40 feet. And come back, and I didn't realize how the uh, convention center had been constructed. I didn't realize or remember that the the settee area was not on top of like a concrete floor or a solid setting. It was a stage built up. So I picked my double bag off a chair. I put my spare ball in it, picked the bag off, and just dropped it. And it, I mean, it hit and it echoed and it shook the stage. And people oh, are all man. around me looking, and one of the lane monitors comes over. Uh, and says, you know, sir, you're going to have to stop with that. And I, I don't think I had a great response for him. Uh -huh. um, 
<laughs> but yeah, that that was one of uh, yeah. my biggest fries from from the OC. Matt, what yeah. about you? You didn't mention that story in the hiring process, so uh, yeah, I kept it. Se- I kept idea. it secret until I knew I was safe to to put it out there. Uh, no, okay. no fries for me. I'm not a uh, I'm not an angry guy in the lanes by any means. Uh, I really haven't done anything uh, spectacular enough to uh, to fry. Uh, I was pretty upset the year that I was a low man in our department. Uh, I feel um, that one, yeah, that one, that one doesn't go away for a while. Oh. Um, but uh, I, I believe I, I did just get enough to get to sixteen hundred and salvage something. But other than that, um, it's been a, a pretty, uh, pretty even keel career for me at the OC. We're gonna have to get you out of the lanes more. I, I'll still say that he, Mike, he won't do it. I need, I need like help to get him. We did the same thing out on the PWBA tour last year with the Bull TV chat members trying to get E back on the lanes. We got to do the same thing with all of our OC people to get Matt Matt back out on the lanes. Matt, aren't you lefty? I, I am. Yeah, I well, said. you don't need to practice then. Wow. <laughs> wow, there it is. There yep, it is. you don't need to practice. Wow. That, that's what they tell me. I'll, uh, yeah. yeah. We'll see. Well, I got, uh, I got another story that one – that people kind of get mixed up, but I can tell you about that one. Of course, it's at the stadium. Um, I think this is the first year. Uh, I don't remember if it's the first year it was in Reno, but at this point, I knew I had a shot of taking the 10 year average lead. So I'm pumped for it. Um, I remember I just signed with track and I shoot shit. I shot like 505, 510, a team event. It was just bad, and of course I'm upset, blah, blah, blah. So we uh, come back, and I'm, I'm ready to bowl better in uh, doubles and singles. And we get to the stadium, and I'm ready to bowl and this and that. We're on a squad with just a bunch of random people, huge group of people, okay? And we're our two, you know, our two teams are from Chicagoland, and, and we're bowling, and we didn't know anyone else. So we're bowling, and these guys aren't really bowlers. So you know what lane courtesy is, but, you know, sometimes you want a little extra time. So I bowl like crap again. I shoot 150. I'm just not throwing the ball good. So I haven't doubled up to this point. So I throw a shot, and this cat goes step for step with me. And this is this guy. He'd been bowling, and he's, you know, boisterous, and he's, you know, having a good time, I guess. But he went step for step with me, and I fried because I I'm on a strike, and I'm I'm pretty worked up. And I turn to him and I go, "Do you want to hold my freaking hand? Where do you bowl?" And I just on the approach, I just yelled, "Do you want to hold my hand and just bowl and we'll walk we'll bowl together?" <laughs> so I I leave the three ten, and I left. I went to the top of the stadium. I remember I walked up to the top of the stairs and I just sat there fuming because I guess that's what I had to do then to get over it. I knew I couldn't bowl fist. And of course, after I screamed at this guy, everyone just froze. Everyone was like, what, the shit? what do we do? So I go sit at the top of the stadium and I just sit there and, and fry for a minute. Um, and the three tens just sitting there. I finally get my crap together. I go down there. I calmly shoot the 310, make it, and for whatever reason, it zeroed me in. I made a move on the lane. Now, I hadn't doubled up to this point. I'm averaging about 160. I crush. I throw. I think I throw the last six for like 240, 250. Um, I save that event, and then I shoot 747 in singles. So I go from shooting 505 and 150. I pop 240 and then shoot, you know, 750 in single. So that's the top of the stadium story. But I, I mean, can't I, imagine why I would have been scared of you after all these stories. <laughs> Sorry, Matt. You know, what do you want me to do? <laughs> so, I mean, you know, we all know that when you're on the lanes, sometimes anger can be the best motivator. Um, certainly that's a, uh, an example of, of how you were able to turn your anger in, into motivation to, to bowl better. But as someone who's experienced fries and has been able to get over them, what? How do you get past it and and try and set? Not maybe not set a better example, but just get past it and and not fry out so quick. How would bowlers in general? How would they be able to do that? Not let their emotions get to them in a negative way. 
Well, you got to understand, and it takes a while when you're young. You know, I mean, I was 14 years old, practiced at an anchor ball, and I kicked the ball return. I don't know why. I had built up hostility, I guess. I don't know. You know, you psychoanalyze it and you figure out something screwed up. But I was 14 years old kicking rats, you know. Um, you know, you got to figure out what it was. For me, I would just get really pissed and I would blow up and it would like zero me in. And I would like almost tunnel vision. For whatever reason, it focused me. I got over whatever the hell I was having a problem with. I would refocus myself and I was able to, uh, it actually didn't hurt me. I had bowled good after that you know but you got to understand how you work too it took me a while to figure out you know you got to blow it up then you can get over it and then you can zero in you know everybody's different but for me i had to have that explosion and it would kind of put me back and center me so for people who are trying to figure it out there's nothing wrong with getting pissed it shows that you care a lot but you got to understand how to make it work for yourself it doesn't work the same way for everybody you know my son gets mad and it doesn't necessarily help him you know, and I tell him the stories, you know, what I would do, but you got to figure out what works for you. For him, it didn't work. So you got to figure out, you know, if you're going to get pissed, you know, walk away from the lane, go do a couple of breathing exercises, you know, go get a drink of water or, or do whatever you got to do. Getting mad isn't necessarily a bad thing, you know, and of course, you know, for me, I didn't represent myself well sometimes and so be it, you know, I'm a mature guy now, so I can kind of deal with it better but you just got to figure out how it works for you you know i mean daniel you're a young guy you know you, you figure out what fries you out and and you figure out how to get over it you know uh you you absolutely do um i've i certainly have my father's temper so i've i've learned you know throughout my 20s um i acted out and, and now that i'm into my early 30s i've 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 found a way to kind of make it work for me in a way. Uh, last question I do have on this topic actually it comes from one of our Facebook viewers. Uh, Terrence Lewis asked, I just wondered, Mike, did the other bowler say anything to you after the hand-holding comment? <laughs> no, they were terrified. <laughs> <laughs> no, they didn't say anything. They just looked at me like, what is wrong with this guy? You know, but, but after I blew up, I was fine. Now I understood that this guy was going to go. I just let him go. I settled down. I wasn't a prick anymore, you know. And I just, every time he was up, I let him go until he was done. So, so in, uh, in, in more recent years, uh, you've had some experience, uh, coaching in, in college bowling. And certainly Matt had, uh, had experience at the university of Florida. I went to Lindenwood and uh, you've been coaching at Elmhurst college. Talk about that and, and what that's been like over the last uh, few recent years. Well, I did it for six years. So I'm no longer coaching. Um, but it, it kind of replaced the bowling for me. You know, I got to a point where, you know, I just wasn't bowling as good as I could. I have, uh, you know, the, the elbow injury, the wrist injury, the knees, all that stuff. And I was like, you know what, let me coach for a while, you know, and I enjoyed it. Um, you you want to give back. You know, bowling has been pretty good for me. So I wanted to give back. So I enjoyed coaching uh, the girls of Elmhurst. And um, I had a couple good seasons. I had, uh, I think my second season, I had our team ranked uh, 23rd in the country at our highest point. I was really proud of that, teaching the girls how to play the lanes. And being a D3 school, there is a lot of work involved. You know, mm -hmm. you're not getting girls who are finely tuned. You got to do the tuning, you know, so it was fun. I enjoyed working it. And, and it's great when you can see a girl who, you know, was at kind of a medium level they listen to you, they work at it, and all of a sudden they're competing at a high level. That's very rewarding. So I was happy to give back to the sport. Um, and it was the same kind of lifestyle. I'm traveling, you know, out of town in the bowling center all day, all night. Uh, so it kind of had that same kind of feel as if mm -hmm. I was bowling. What, what was there? I mean, it's just my check was guaranteed. You know, the what, was there a different kind of... That as a coach, was there a different kind of stress watching your players bowl as compared to you throwing the ball yourself? A hundred percent. It took me a while to figure that out. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like I knew what motivated me. I had the desire to do better, and I tried to instill that on them. And quite frankly, some of them didn't like it and didn't want it. Mm -hmm. You know, they were happy to go out there and bowl how they bowled. And, you know, I'd get pretty worked up. You know, we had a chance at bowling for a, a title in Ohio. And one of the girls misses a five pin. She makes that five pin 
now it's like it comes down to the tenth. This girl just up and flags a five pin in the ninth frame and unaffected. And me, I'm just like ready to pull my hair out. You know, so <laughs> it's a, it, you know, everything's a learning learning curve. And I, I dialed it back after a while, but you know, you definitely gotta coach the women's bowling team a little bit different than you would a men's bowling team. And you know, it took me a while to figure that stuff out, but I did. And I had a great time. But. You know, get, getting to the emotion of it, you know, we talked about, you You talked about that. It, it takes you a while to learn how to make your, let's take that word anger out and use the word emotion, make your emotion on the lanes work for you. Uh, you know, coaching 18, 19, 20-year-olds, uh, undeveloped brains, undeveloped emotions, still immature. What was it like when they got out of control and how did you handle them when their emotion boiled over the top? I sent him over to uh, my assistant coach, Ton Williams. I let her handle that stuff. <laughs> I didn't know how to deal with a girl. I grew up with three brothers. We had a problem. We would just fight, <laughs> you know, <laughs> chase each other around with bats. But uh, no. <laughs> seriously, uh, you know, I, I tried to figure out what each what motivated each girl. Some girls would get upset and just kind of shut down. Some girls would pout. You know, some girls would get mad. I tell them, hey, go. Take a break. I'll pull you for a couple frames. Get yourself back together. Mm-hmm. You know, go get a breather. You know, go take a walk. Go catch a, a, a breath, you know, or whatever. I try to figure it out with them um, and kind of let them do it as they need. And I try to give them guidance, you know. I would just tell them, hey, you know, this is just bowling. This isn't a big deal. I said, but it's okay to try to work at something. It's okay to try to reach for something and fail. It's okay. I said, it's like a ladder, you know, maybe you won't get all the way up to the top, but you got higher than the bottom. So go ahead and go for it. So being a, a dad whose son bowls, uh, I will say being the son of someone who, you know, my father ran a pro shop for worked worked in a pro shop for 30 plus years. I've, I've grown up around the sport and 95% of my accomplishments on the lanes have come either alongside him or because of his tutelage. Uh, what has it been like? Do you coach your son, first of all? Yeah, I, I teach him as much as I can, and my daughter, Allison. Um, I, I try to teach him everything I could, and then I tried to leave him alone the last few years. It's like I figured I got him as close as I could, and now I got to let him kind of fend for himself. Everything I learned, I learned about bowling, I didn't have a coach. I just did trial and error, show up at the bowling alley, practice, do it. Didn't work, try something else. So I tried to get him in a pretty good position at Allison um, and then try to let them work it out. Get on the lanes, bowl, throw it, you know, and then I would, of course, come in and say, hey, you know, you probably got to do X, Y, or Z. But I try to get them in a decent position and then let them work it out on their own and uh, and then chime back in for, uh, you know, for some fine tuning. But I try to teach them about bowling balls and lane play and, and how to play the lanes, why to play the lanes, and just try to basically give them, educate them so that they can learn it and then apply it on their own. One of the things that I remember dad saying is that it took him a while to learn that when we're on the lanes, he has to put his coach hat on and take off the dad hat. But every now and then when I would start acting up, whether as a kid or a 33 year old man, um, he has to flip hats real quick and put the dad hat back on. Have you had to do that with your son often? Oh, oh. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. You know, sometimes like in, uh, I coach him in baseball too. You know, sometimes he'd have a little trouble focusing. I remember when I was throwing him batting practice, he couldn't focus. So I just whipped the ball at him and hit him in the shoulder. <laughs> so, you know, I, <laughs> I drilled him, but that's awesome. Now I didn't actually, throw right there. Hard, but I did, I did throw one up and in on him to get his attention. He crushed the ball after that. So. You know, he's trying to figure out what motivated. But yeah, the well, dad that, that, that's a way of, of, of you trying to help him make his anger work for him, I guess. Yeah, I guess. It's like, hey, come on, snap out of it. You know, sometimes I'd yell at him. Sometimes I'd leave him alone. Sometimes I'd, you know, I just try to figure it out. So was Junior better than you? No, he throws the ball better than me for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but is he better? And it depends. He has good days and bad days. When he's on, he's he crushes. He throws the ball like I used to. You know, but he's still a little green. He's still learning. He's, he's, uh, you know, working into his maturity. I blossomed late. You know, I, I didn't really 
kind of get my crap together till I was well in my 20s. So I'm thinking he might be the same way. So when are we going to see you guys as a father-son do out, out on the lanes? Well, probably, uh, I don't think this year, because he's 19, he wants to bowl junior gold, and he's still bowling in college. Um, but probably the year after that, when he's ready. And I was thinking maybe when he turns 21, because then he's it's his golden birthday, and then I can take him out and have a good time out of town. But he'll be out soon enough. We'll get him there. All right. Well, we're, uh, we'll talk about having a good time here and just looking at some of the folks in our live chat here. Uh, it's like a who's who of the Midwest right now. Greg Zika, oh. check it in. Kevin Gamak. Uh, let's see who else. Uh, Jeff Fanaskis, uh, Lisa Vent sighting as well. Matt McNeil. Uh, so these are the guys who know the legacy of Michael Nape. Uh, we mentioned earlier uh, the, uh, the PBA Midwest Dictionary uh, as well. You also have 13... PBA regional title. So you uh, you spent some time out there. You got the job done. Uh, you made a name for yourself. You made a nickname or two for yourself as well. Uh, but uh, real quick to uh, to entertain the folks, give them what they came for. We've got a few minutes here. Uh, yeah. Let's go. Uh, let's talk about this dictionary a little bit. The mythical dictionary. Uh, maybe your your top three phrases that are podcast appropriate uh, from that that uh, really only somebody from the Midwest might know about. Well, too bad. Of course, I don't know how I came up with that, but too bad whether you did something good you did something bad um but i would yell too bad i'd trip a four six seven ten out for a strike too bad um one of my best too bads ever was when i won the nrpc we're bowling at the stadium i guess i bowled really good at the stadium um i'm bowling the first match in the in the uh, step ladder and i'm bowling against craig Taholski. and the lanes are rough you know they were always rough at the NRPC. So I'm bowling, bowling the match, and I'm I'm well into the lead. You know, Craig's not bowling real good. And he didn't bowl good, by the way. Um, he threw a four-bagger. He went runaway brook, missed the head pin, dominoed him down, tripped out the four, six, seven, ten, and then, like, rolls a two-pin out of nowhere. This is a four-bagger of, like, the worst shots in history. And he forces me to mark in the tenth. So I'm like, okay. So I go up there, I pinch it. I don't throw it good. I need a mark. I leave a 310. And I'm like, oh man, you better make this spare. And I remember I was throwing a Triton Heat at the spare. So at the stadium, you know, I think we were on one pair just inside of the walkway. So right behind, you know, there's a bunch of people up in the stadium watching the, the tournament. So I'm like, there is no way I'm losing this match. So I leave the 310. I drill it. I make it for the win. And I turn around. Too bad. This is mine. And I just turned to the whole stadium and unleashed on it. Um, and I ran the ladder. And I won the tournament. Mm -hmm. I think I beat Lenny Borish after that. And then I think I beat Mike Edwards for the title. But that was one of the good two bads. Um, there's a bunch of DIA, BIA, EIA, which is drink it all, eat it all, and bet it all. <laughs> we all right. would have some fun with some libations, and uh, we would maybe we went to the casino once or twice. Did we, Riggs? Okay. Did we ever? Did we ever go to uh, the casino? And maybe I threw the dice a little bit too high, and then I get yelled at by the dealers. I don't know. Maybe I hit the ceiling with the dice. <laughs> oh, shit, maybe. <laughs> oh, well, we uh, have some fun. That's BIA, about it all. Um, so now we know, uh, we know you throw the bowling ball very well. We now know that you throw the dice very well. Um, and you also mentioned that uh, in your free time, you're also part of a, a fishing club. So uh, there was a, a question earlier in our chat on which you think uh, you're able to, uh, to throw the best there, the ball, the dice, or, uh, or that fishing line. Oof. Well, I did have an hour-long roll on the dice table. It won about $10,000 with Bobby Jekyll. But that was a one-time deal. I'd say right now I probably fish better. <laughs> <laughs> I still throw the ball pretty decent, but now I throw it like a league bowler instead of a, you know, standout. I just don't have the rev rate anymore, and I can – I got to stay farther right. I can't get into fifth arrow and throw saws anymore. Well, it sounds like some, some pretty great memories from uh, your regional days, your OC days. Uh, anything really stand out? Any top moment? Uh, I imagine the Eagles probably up there, the car. 
Um, you've already mentioned those, but uh, career-wise or experience-wise, anything really uh, top of the list for you? Well, winning the Eagle, of course, I, it, that's probably a pinnacle because so many people both trying trying to win an Eagle and having the success, you know, being in the, the top, you know, lifetime average lead, 20-year lead for four out of five years and, and still maintaining a high average. You know, that's cool. But when I won the NRPC, I got to bowl the Tournament of Champions. And that's before they wrecked the Tournament of Champions by letting people who weren't champions bowl the Tournament of Champions. How how do you call it the Tournament of Champions if non-champions can bowl? That doesn't make any sense. But I got to bowl that, and that was a big one. It was like, okay, you know, I got to bowl in this prestigious event. I won the National Resident Pro Championship. I thought that one was pretty cool. You know. That one was a good one. Right, now I'm, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna gamble here real quick. You know, live, live yeah, podcast. Yeah. I think for the for the viewers, I think I've found video of uh, of your son. Oh. Now, I'm guessing just simply based on the style, this is him, and it's labeled uh, Mike Nape Jr. Oh yeah, yep. So for those of you wondering, yeah, that was high school. <laughs> <laughs> that was junior. <laughs> but that's, you know, you, you say you've coached him. We, we saw a couple shots of you from the 2011 OC. Uh, that looks just like a carbon copy of you. Yeah. yeah. Like I said, he throws it the way I used to for my everything got wrecked. <laughs> <laughs> so now as we transition a little bit uh, toward the end of our show and, and toward the 2020 Open Championships and, and then beyond with the opportunity to potentially bowl with your son, um, you know, just looking back on the career, um, what does it mean if you can describe just to, to be a champion, just to think about that? I know when we, we first talked this week, uh, we talked, brought up all these memories and things and, um, you know, something you'll forever be as an Eagle winner and a champion and something that I'm sure means a ton each year you're introduced will probably mean even more when you're introduced with your son. Uh, and then maybe we'll see a kind of a, a second, a 2.0 career for Michael Nape at the OC. But uh, what does all that mean? Knowing that, uh, you know, in 1988, could you have ever imagined the success you were going to go on to have? No. Um, and that was my first one in Jacksonville. Um, I just remember the guys talking about the USB, the, well, ABCs, you know, going out there. And I, I just treated it with respect. I went and I got prepared for it. I went out there to screw around. You know, some guys go out there, they have a nice vacation. For me, I was going out there trying to bowl good. So I don't know if I would want to do it again. I mean, I'm glad I did it. That's a lot of pressure. You know, there's a lot of pressure involved going out there trying to bowl good. I'm kind of glad that I did it and that I don't feel that pressure anymore. Because you, uh, you know, when you're expected to perform, you got to go out there. You know, it's not always easy. And it's not like uh, I was king of the world or anything, but, you know, for what I wanted to do, I put a lot of effort into it. I would practice. I'd get myself mentally ready and, and go out there and throw the ball. So looking back, it's kind of nice to have those memories and to look back over them. It's almost like you enjoy them more the older that you get. Because when you're young, you're expected to bowl good. You know, like Daniel, you go out, you want to bowl good, don't you? You want to go out there and, and you're like, okay, I'm in my prime. I'm going out there and I'm going to get it done, but you don't mm -hmm. kind of enjoy it while it's going on because you're expected to do it. And now sitting here, I'm 51. I can look back and go, yeah, that was, that was, that was pretty good. Those were a lot of good sets, you know, and when you're bowling them, you're like, no, this is what I'm supposed to do. And now it's like, yeah, this feels pretty good thinking about it, looking back over it. And, you know, you get to enjoy those memories with people. And, and of course, all the friends that you make, you know, Doug Buer, Larry Stepp, you know, Riggs, Lenny Borish, you know, you look back and you miss all them guys, Steve Rogers, and, you know, you miss all them guys that you used to hang around with, but it's good to get together and chat once in a while, Doug's Barbecue in St. Louis, um, shoot the shit and, you know, still see some of the guys from local. We get to hang out and, and do stuff, but I guess that's part of getting older too. You know, you lose a little bit of that competitive drive. It doesn't eat at you to want to win everything. You're sometimes you're content going out there and throwing the ball well and, and trying to get some money back. Now I'm not saying I wouldn't want to win another Eagle, uh -huh. you know, I mean, just like many people's goals, you know, want to get into the USBC hall of fame, that would be amazing. Um, I don't know if we'll ever get there for another Eagle, 
but it doesn't mean I'm not out trying. And I, I got a good team that we still bowl together, bowling with uh, AJ Johnson, Sean Johnson, Zika, and uh, Craig Sweat. We definitely we we can get our we can get our stuff together. We can still have another good uh, good run at it. So there's a little piece of trivia affairs. Craig Sweat. First bowler in Open Championships history with three perfect games on the tournament lanes. There you go. There's your lesson for the day. See, and I remember that name because I've seen it in the record book spelled. And I was like, how do you how do you pronounce that? I <laughs> so now him, I know. I call him Sizzle Plet. <laughs> <laughs> but man, that guy, I mean, that is sick. I can I had that one 300 in 1996. Man, that was awesome. I had the front nine in that video that you showed. Um mm -hmm. three 300s, dude. That's awesome. You know, I, I liked one of the things you said there, talking about that uh, you don't know that you want to go through the the pressure that you felt because even when you do succeed uh, at that level, it's hard to enjoy it. And I've kind of explained this. Uh, it, it was first explained to me by my father, you know, as a coach, kind of getting back to that, the difference between watching someone throw a ball that you care about and you throwing the ball yourself. And that's it. If, if I win something, you know, at a very local level, you know, a one-day event – it, it's done. You feel good. You're happy. You're you're elated. But those, you know, week long events or, or something like the Open Championships, uh, when you get done, there's been so much pressure and stress and emotion that instead of feeling happy, you're just relieved that it's over. Yeah, you're glad you didn't screw up and miss a tenth and a tenth uh -huh. to lose or something like that. You know, right. All right what's a, actually a perfect segue as far as uh, things coming to an end. Uh, we're winding down here for uh, this episode of Inside the OC, uh, but also uh, the world slowly going back to normal here in the in the face of this COVID-19. And uh, Michael, I'm sure you're excited to get back to work and, and get back to the bowlers. You mentioned all the great friends and all the great things uh, that you're not getting able to do right now. Um, but once it's all done and, and the world's back to normal, what are you most looking forward to uh, out there in the real world? normalcy really i mean i don't want to see this country change i want things to go back kind of the way they were you know i want fox bowl to be successful like it's been for the last 25 years and see all the people you know i mean we're a heavy league, league bowling center you know i don't want this to screw up uh, the way our business works i got lots of friends that i see um you go to fox bowl and i know virtually everyone that bowls there you walk in i'm going to know who you are i know that you bowl with us um you miss the people and you miss your your comrades in arms you know i miss all the guys that you work with um financially it's going to be good for me too i don't want to sit here not working um so just looking forward to getting back to work uh some normalcy back into our uh, all of our lives all across the country and uh my daughter's graduating high school i want her to have some semblance of a graduation um she signed. She's bowling for uh, St. Francis Joliet. That's the same place that Junior goes. So I got two kids there. So I'm gonna get to watch them. Uh, I'm gonna get to watch them bowl in the near future. You know, I spent a lot of time coaching Elmhurst College. Um, so now I want to watch my kids bowl. So I'll be able to get to see them bowl more often. So I'm looking forward to that. And then, of course, there can't have too many fishing trips. Never have enough right. of those. Get out, get up to Minnesota. I have Matt McNeil is supposed to take me on to uh, onto the lakes up there. Find me some good fishing holes, Matt. That's it. You heard it here. So now he's now he now he has no choice. No, he's got no no chance to back out now. <laughs> <laughs> so all right. Well, we we certainly look forward to hopefully seeing some of the Fox Bowl crew, even yourself, potentially at the National Bowling Stadium in 2020. The event kicks off September 12th, runs until November 22nd. Uh, we hope to see uh, all the great bowlers get some new stories and, and great things coming out of there this year. Daniel going to make his first trip as uh, a member of our PR team as well. Uh, Daniel, any final questions uh, for Mr. Nate before we head out for the day? Yeah, it's kind of a, a normal question that we ask. We've asked a lot of our uh, the champions we've had on the show, and that's, you know, it, it's more fitting for you because you have a 19-year-old son who in the next year or two uh, is going to make his first trip to the O.C., uh, what advice would you have for a first-time OC participant, whether they're a, a 19, 20-year-old kid making their first trip or a, a 42-year-old who just picked up bowling and was told, hey, come bowl this event. It's fun. What advice would you have for a first-time participant? Well, make sure that you're fairly well 
practice and sharp so that you can make good shots. Um, I would I would let my bowling dictate what to see on the lanes. I would always get you know to the stadium and I would scout it out, but I wouldn't take that to be like uh, gospel. You know, you watch someone else bowl and you see they might be playing up five. You're like, oh man, the gutter's in play. You know, you got to throw the ball and try to read the lanes. You got to, if you're bowling team event and you don't break the lanes down, I almost don't even want to tell everyone because I see so many people play the lanes wrong and just kind of screw themselves. But if you don't play the lanes together, don't expect a good score. Don't, you're just not going to happen. It's just not. You play the lanes right, you can open up the lanes and, you know, you can shoot a nice team event. But if you play all over the place, you know, you're going to be toast. Get together with your teammates, communicate, um, play the lanes right, do what you need to do as a team. When it comes to doubles and singles, you got to communicate with those bowlers as well um, as to what you see on the lanes. Talk it out, you know, especially if you're good bowlers, you know. For people who aren't necessarily going out there to win an eagle or maybe just don't know that they have the opportunity to, enjoy it for what it is. It's a national tournament. It's the USBC Open Championships. All the league bowlers in the country are going out there, trying to bowl good, having a good time, and enjoy the camaraderie on the lanes. Go out there, do what you can do, and have a good score, and maybe not have a good score, but try to enjoy yourselves. Now, that's advice there's... coming from a 51-year-old me, not the 35-year-old me. <laughs> <laughs> of course, there's no place like the National Bowling Stadium in Reno, Nevada. And uh, some great advice from our 2018 Mall Events champion and past lifetime average leader, Michael Nape. Uh, Biggin, as they call you, any final thoughts here uh, for the fans and uh, for the, the Midwest folks and everybody else tuning in to, uh, to get to know you a little bit here? Well, I mean, speaking of the Midwest region, you know, like I said, we're we're a big traveling family out there. Every weekend we would see each other. We'd all bowl together. We'd compete against each other. But after we were done, we would enjoy each other's company. So we'd, we'd go out to dinner. You know, we might have a, have a beer or two. We might go to the boat, fire, do a little gambling, um, maybe sneak out. Of course, I would bring fishing poles always, sneak out, find a little pond, catch some fish in between blocks. But it was a traveling family. So, I mean, it's nice to uh, think back on all the old memories with all the fellas. Um, and, uh, you know, it's good to talk about uh, good memories. All right. Well, we appreciate your time and all the great stories. And thank you for being a part of our OC Bowling family. And thanks to all you folks who have tuned in today to get some insight into the life and career of OC champion Michael Nape. Remember to keep an eye out on Bowl TV. For our regular podcast, Inside the OC, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Also, the PWBA podcast on Mondays and Wednesdays. And the Sport of Bowling show as well. So a lot of great stuff, great guests. A lot of great questions answered. And uh, we look forward to seeing you guys again here on Bowl TV on Thursday. My name is Matt Canizaro for Daniel Farish and Michael Nave. That's the news for now. 